Dear friends, dear friends, please take your seats. Dear friends, Ivana, take your seat, please. You know, in our conference we have some traditions, and two years ago we established established one, I think, very important tradition, and this tradition is uh, Paris Peace Lecture. Two years ago, first lecture was made by Prime Minister Tony Blair. I think it was great speech about seven lessons from President Paris, and some people told me that for them it was most interesting uh, event during our that conference. This time we have great honor to have a great speaker. President Santos of Colombia. He is Nobel Prize winner, no, Nobel Prize for Peace winner. And I'm sure it, for us for you, in Ukraine, his experience is in peacemaking, critically important and valuable. I'm sure it, it, it will be a very interesting lecture. But before that lecture, we want to present for you first time very very special introduction dear friends please take your seat please 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 because now i will need your silence this very special introduction was made by artificial intelligence and of course was fully agreed with the team of President Shimon Peres. Dear friends, please close the door. Close the door, take a seat. Now just I need your silence and attention. That's all. Please watch. I'm delighted to be with you today. It is the fourth time I speak at YES conference, and this time I would like to recall some of my previous ideas discussed here before, which I believe are still important now. I think we are in a revolutionary age. We are in a crisis. We left the past and have not yet reached the future. I'm afraid that most people prefer to remember the past rather than to imagine the future. This is the greatest mistake. If I may make a recommendation, leave the past alone. Instead, focus your attention on the future. There are many questions to be answered. Can you merge science and economy? If you want to understand the future of the economy, one should not go to the banks or the stock exchange. Looking to the old economy will not provide the solution because the old economy was based on the accumulation of things. Go to the laboratories, see what is happening there. This is where you will find the economy of tomorrow. 
Science does not have borders. Science does not have limitations. And science changes the nature of our system. Can you imagine this? I know that there are two things in life that you cannot achieve unless you close your eyes. Love and peace. You have to lower expectations, be more generous, give less room for experience and more room for imagination. Only this way, peace can happen. What is true leadership? The governments today, I must say, are afraid to govern. People say that the government is so anxious to be popular that they no longer trust it. And the very concept of leadership has changed. A leader today is not a person who stands on the top, but rather a person who moves things forward if you admit that you want to be on top, the bottom will not support you. On top of all these problems, we still have one more. The young generation, your children, do not want to follow you. They are better informed. They are up to date. They are not limited by prejudices and memories. There is a thing in English. Seeing is believing. The fact is, believing is seeing. For me, it's clear. We have to believe in our young generation. How can they build their own future? I'm asked from time to time, what is your greatest mistake in life? My answer is, when I look back, that the greatest mistake was that our dreams were too small. Dream great, don't be afraid. Believe me, you will be as great as your dreams. And I tell young people, my dear friends, you can be as small as your ego, or you can be as great as the cause you sell. People ask me, how can you stay active? I say, it is very simple. Count the number of achievements in your life and count the number of dreams in your mind. If you think your achievements are greater than your dreams, you are old. If the number of the dreams exceed the number of achievements, you are young. So dream great and dream young. Thank you. That was extraordinary. It's just three years ago that Shimon Peres departed this world. He was uh, one of the great statesmen of the second half of the 20th century and the beginning of, of this one. And he was really, uh, he came from a part of the world that many of us associate with pessimism, but he was ultimately the world's greatest optimist. And Today we are going to be presenting the uh, award in his name to someone who's truly deserving, who not only was someone who dreamt big dreams, but turned his dream into a reality. Juan Manuel Santos was the president of Colombia. He, uh, as Victor said, the recipient of the uh, Nobel Prize, Nobel Peace Prize, and he was instrumental to bringing about the peace agreement between the government and the FARC. So we are going to hear from uh, the president, from President Santos, and then afterwards we have a uh, special recognition for him. Mr. President, El Piso es suyo. <laughs> Thank you very much, and thank you for this invitation. I'm very honored to be here with you today. Shimon Perez, 
marvelous person. I had a very good and close relationship with him, and he was very inspiring. He won the Nobel Peace Prize along with the, the Prime Minister Isaac Rabin and uh, with Arafat. And uh, what I want to share with you today is some experience that, experiences that he had, and he just mentioned something which is very important. Popular governments, popular governments, if you want to maintain your popularity, it's very difficult to make peace. You have to be willing to lose your popularity, to lose your political capital, if you want to make peace. And I will try to explain why. Seeing Shimon Peres with his two companions, Arafat and Rabin. Rabin had a, a doctrine, or he said to the world and to his people, because they were very uh, uh, apprehensive with his reach to Arafat, he said, don't worry, I will negotiate with the terrorism, with Arafat, as if there is no terrorism. But I will continue to fight terrorism as if there is no peace process. He took a very difficult decision that I followed. And uh, why, I say, why do I say it's difficult? Because there is nothing more difficult than to explain to your public opinion that while you're talking, you're killing each other uh, in the other side of the street. He even paid with his life because they killed him for having the courage to take that step. I decided to take the similar step and another Israeli, very good friend, former Minister of Foreign Affairs, Shlomo Ben-Ami, said, you will pay with your political capital and who knows even with your life, but that's the only way you can achieve your objective. And I did pay with my political capital because I was elected as president in the year 2010 with the highest margin ever in the Colombian democracy and I was elected because I was very successful making war. And as soon as I sat with my former enemies, my popularity started to come down because I was called a traitor. And that is what many peacemakers have to go through. Ex explain that uh, peace is better than war. Sometimes people don't uh, understand how this very logical uh, statement uh, is true. M many countries or many leaders that want to maintain their popularity uh, maintain it because leading in times of war is much, much easier than leading to make peace. When you're at war, the type of leadership is very vertical and very straightforward. The bad guys are on the one side, the good guys are here. You rally the people around you and you go after the bad guys. And you give orders. And as long as you're successful, your popularity keeps going up and up and you maintain it. Instead, when you change when you want to make peace. The type of leadership is more horizontal. You don't give orders. You have to persuade and you have to convince people who have suffered to be willing to forgive. To tell a mother whose son has been killed or whose daughter has been raped that she has to support giving the perpetrators a more beneficial, uh, a beneficial uh, advantage in the 
judicial world is extremely difficult. But that's the only way that you can achieve peace. In the, in the bottom, making peace is drawing the line between peace and justice. And always, always, there will be people from one side or from the other who will not agree with whatever decision you take. And you have to be prepared to confront uh, those people, usually within your own ranks. It happened to Mandela. It happened in Northern Ireland. The, the two negotiators were called traitors by their own people. This is a political cost you must be willing to take if you want peace. Here in the Ukraine, if you want real peace with the counterpart, you have to be willing to give some concessions. And uh, some people will be very mad, but that's the only way to reach a viable and long-term agreement. Another aspect, important, that I learned from uh, Shimon Perez, you must bring in the c correct stakeholders. The people who really determine if there can be peace or not. In the case of Colombia, one of those stakeholders were my neighbors with whom I had the worst of all relationships. No diplomatic relations, no trade relations with Venezuela and with Ecuador, very bad with Brazil, but those were major stakeholders that I had to bring in. And I brought them in. And they were very, very useful. They were determinant in the final outcome. I brought in the military that my predecessors, all my predecessors had failed, all had tried, and all had failed trying to reach peace with the FARC, the oldest and strongest guerrilla movement in the whole of the Western Hemisphere. And one of the reasons why they failed was because they did not bring the military into the conversations. They all thought that the military would be against peace by definition, because the military are there and they have power and they have resources because they're making war. And they were wrong. The military are the first interested in making peace because they are the ones who put their lives at risk. So I brought in the most prestigious general of the army and the most prestigious general of the police and I named them negotiators. And that was a very important uh, aspect of the success of the agreement. Everybody today is wondering about Venezuela, our neighbors. Colombia is suffering very much because we are receiving uh, refugees from Venezuela. Uh, right now we have a million and a half refugees only in Colombia. And they asked me, what is the solution to Venezuela? And I say there are many, many common denominators. You have to bring the stakeholders that are really relevant. And who are these stakeholders? Russia, China, Cuba, the US, and Latin America. But there's another stakeholder that has never been invited to any negotiation, which I say is the most important one, the military in Venezuela. They own more than 65% of the economy. And everybody says, Whatever happens to Venezuela will be determined by the military, but they have never been invited to the negotiating table. All the uh, attempts, the, the Norwegians, the, the Swedes, 
uh, the Spanish uh, former president uh, Zapatero and all the attempts, we have never seen the military there represented. And without them participating in the peace process, there will never be a successful outcome. And uh, Shimon Perez also uh, insisted in something which is extremely important. You have to build the right conditions for a peace process to be successful. You have to study the circumstances. Every peace process has different circumstances and some have common denominators. In the case of Colombia, for example, we needed to have the, the guerrilla commanders uh, convinced that for them personally, peace was better than war. To continue the war would be against their personal interest. And here I must thank uh, Prime Minister Tony Blair because he helped me very much in the process of convincing the commanders through the intelligence and through striking uh, very high value targets that they would do better by negotiating peace than by simply continuing the war. So you have here a set of ingredients. Uh, you, have to be, uh, you have to be conscious that uh, making peace is much more difficult than making war, and you have to uh, ri take the risk of losing all your political capital. You must identify the correct stakeholders, and you must create the necessary conditions. And when you have those ingredients, the probability of making peace uh, is much higher, and that way you'll be much more successful. And uh, the last point I want to make, and this is uh, very important in any peace process, you have to show that after the peace process, the post-conflict uh, will be better for the majority of the people, because that will, that will uh, serve as a great incentive for the people who are neutral, who are skeptic, to at least be interested in achieving some kind of deal. And uh, that is the message I wanted to leave to you uh, in these short 15 minutes. Uh, and I want to thank you, and I want to thank uh, Shimon Perez, who now is watching us from heaven and from artificial intelligence, uh, because he was a great inspiration for me in this very difficult peace process, which, uh, as every peace process has, its ups and downs. We just had uh, an event, uh, uh, something that happened some days ago. Two of the former guerrilla commanders went to Venezuela, and they said they're going up ag again in arms. And uh, somebody asked me, how, how dangerous, how important is this? And I said, this process is a long-term process. You find obstacles every day. You have to persevere. You have to continue. This is one other obstacle. I don't think this is uh, going to be determinant at all. On the contrary, what has happened, and this is a paradox, that the country united and demanded the president of Colombia of today to comply with the agreement as a response to what these two commanders uh, said. And the most important thing is that 90% of the FARC members that are now in the process came out and said, we will continue. We are committed to constructing the peace in Colombia, which will take time. But that is the only way out to have a better country. Thank you. Thank you, uh, President Santos. Don't go anywhere. 
Uh, I want to invite uh, Yonor Batal to come up to, uh, in her words, the Bima, to uh, the stage. Uh, Yonor was for decades one of Shimon Perez's closest advisors. Before that, also worked with Itzach Rabin. And I can't think of anyone better uh, to present a memento, as you will see, of Shimon Perez to uh, Juan Manuel. Thank you, everybody. First of all, thank you from the bottom of my heart to dear Victor Pinchuk and his wonderful wife and Thomas. You did amazing things. I miss him so much. The world miss him so much. Thank you very much. I'm Yona Bartal. I am the luckiest person in this room. I worked with Shimon Peres 22 amazing years. And I remember every year coming to Yalta conference here, to this amazing conference. He loved the place. He know he admired the issues that you are dealing with here in the Yalta with a lot of courage. Thank you. As a, you know, Director General of the President, I remember your great visit, President. I was standing with Shimon Peres at the red carpet when he received you, and then he told you this. You are an important and influential visitor and a dear, true friend of Israel who seeks for peace. You are deserving of all praise and admiration, Shimon Peres. I must, I must uh, tell you an anecdote of Shimon Perez. Uh, the first time I met him, he said to me, the closest I've been to death was in Colombia. And I was very surprised. I said, why? And he said, I was a very, very young officer. And uh, I was uh, trying to sell some military equipment to Colombia right after uh, the war. And uh, I went there and I took a plane from the capital city to another city in the coast. It was a plane, very rudimentary plane with two engines and one of the engines blew up in the middle of the flight. And he said, I had to take a decision with the pilots. We were only four or five persons there. Should we try to land in the middle of the jungle? Or the pilot said, most probably the other engine will blow out before we uh, land in, a, in a, a, a city called Barranquilla. And we looked at each other, and we saw the jungle. And the jungle was not very appealing. And we said, we will risk it. Let's continue. And we made it. And this is a, something that uh, uh, Simon Perez told me, the very, very first meeting I had with him. And that, in a way, made us very close, since he had been uh, uh, at risk, such a risk in my country. Thank you. Thanks again.